two in a way. And then, round near, there's the, the, the town wall, which, of course, follows the shoreline and then turns right inland and were once upon a time connected with the castle over there on the far corner. It would have been really a heck of a place to take. Carnarvon took nearly 50 years to build, and at nearly £20,000 it was the most expensive of all of Edward's Welsh castles. The total cost of them all was over £78,000, but as his wars there had cost him £103,000, the castle seemed like a good investment. Even so, the cost of them coupled with Edward's wars in Scotland was making a bit of a dent in his finances. And there's nowhere better to see this than just across the Menai Straits on Anglesey. This is Paul Morris and its design is the most technically perfect in the wall of Britain. It would have been Master James's greatest masterpiece, but the king ran out of money and he couldn't afford to finish it. Like Carnarvon, it has layers of walls within walls, but unlike Carnarvon, it is perfectly symmetrical, and the wall site is surrounded by a moat filled with a controlled supply of tidal water. This was the state of the art of the 13th century. There are no less than four successive lines of defence built into this castle. Even if you did manage to battle your way over the drawbridge and then under three sets of death holes, people pouring red-hot boiling tar down into your chain mail and you eventually arrived in here. This was just another death hole in a way, but a lot bigger because all round there's all arrow slots everywhere behind you and over there and you've got to fight your way through all of that lot. They'd be raining down on you like red-hot bloody knitting needles and then you finally... You went round this corner here, and you've got to go through all the same thing again. If you manage to survive the drawbridge and the first set of murder holes and various doors, and you finally got to here, if you didn't look like a pincushion, there was yet one more great door with six-inch square box of oak behind it, holding it closed, and then just four foot further in, a, a portcullis, which you would have to get rid of, possibly made of iron with great big rivets through. And then, good God forbid, another four sets of murder holes, and then another door, and another portcullis, and then another door. You could, I don't think anybody could have ever actually managed to get through this lot. You'd have a job do it with a tank, I reckon, definitely. <laughs> But it's not until you enter the art of Bulmaris that you get an idea of the sheer scale of its defences. If you succeeded in getting this far, which I very much doubt you would, you still not won. You wouldn't be able to get at the king because the rest of the soldiers would be round the walls and arrows would be raining down on you one more time. So you'd still not won. You'd got to cross the wall centre here and take the building over there with the king in it. In fact, the castle was surrendered twice in its history, but it was never ever taken by any form of assault. The scale of Beaumaris is incredible. Through the gates of its protected armour, over 2,000 men shifted more than 32,000 tonnes of stone they mixed more than 2,000 tonnes of lime mortar and nailed over 100,000 nails into more than 3,000 boards and all that was done in just one year. When James of St George and the King built these castles, spirit levels haven't been invented. If you go around and look at the moat and look at the bed joints of the masonry, it's perfectly level with the, with the water. There wouldn't be any water, of course, in the moat when they built the place. And the only things they had were, were things like this. Basically a stick, the piece of string uh, with, a, with a, a lead weight on the end, and, of course, a, a nice hole that received the lead weight, and a, and, a, and a line drawn up the middle. And, of course, when you put it on the wall like that, if the wall is plumb, the lead weight will hang perfectly central in the, in the hole, you see. If it leans, of course... You know, the wall, the ball's in the wrong shot. And that's how they got everything vertical. I mean, you, you can naturally compare it with a modern spirit level. And, of course, 
you know, bang on, you see, it's perfect. We've not improved that much, really, have we? This here behind me is all that remains of the once grand gatehouse, you know, the inner gatehouse. And of course, Charles II issued orders to demolish it. As you can see, he didn't get so far, you know, he got the top bit off okay, but I think when he got to here, they must have given up, you know, I mean, no doubt they have no dynamite in them days. In a way, he did us a favour because he, he sort of shown us how the walls really built, you know. The, the fact that there's beautiful dress stones on the outside with nice narrow joints and then in the middle it's just big lumps of all sorts thrown in with with uh, a great deal of mortar you know but they made sure there were no real voids in it you know and of course over the back here there's two lines of inclined holes which would have contained the put logs with an inclined plane on it as the wall advanced upwards, they left a stone missing, stuck a piece of wood onto the top of the wall they'd already built, and then tied a fir pole or a tree trunk to the other end, and then put boards across, which, of course, to enable them to raise the materials to the top of the wall as it advanced in an upward direction. They did have cranes, but they were too slow, and I don't think they would have delivered the necessary amount of materials up to the top of the wall. So they, they devised, like, the incline plane, where maybe two or three men could drag a box full of mortar up. The thing is, I still use, basically, the same methods today. It's much easier to drag an heavy weight than it is to actually lift it up and carry it, because you'd, you'd have to go out and get a crane or an helicopter nowadays to, to get something high up. But if it's of a reasonable weight and, and it can be dragged along, you know, on some sort of sledge, it's a lot cheaper. It might be a bit slower and more inconvenient, but it still works. Maris was never finished. It was so incredibly expensive, the king just simply couldn't afford it. I mean, when you look around and see the amount of chambers and staircases and fireplaces there are compared with the other castles, you can see the reason why. And it never really got any further than this level here, and that was 20 years after the king had died. The king died in 1307, closely followed by James. Hugh Morris really is a monument to the great dreams that they had. They both had the ideas of grandeur, but not the money or the time. That's the reason, really, that the thing's unfinished. Time and tide waits for no man, not even the king. But you have to admit that together they built something that changed the face of Britain. And in the castles of Edward I, Master James of St George has left us with some of the most impressive structures in the world. He also heralded more peaceful times. Next week, I'll be finding out how the castle gave way to the country manor house as the violent days of the Middle Ages came to an end. If you'd like to find out more about the building of Britain, then why not visit the website at bbc.co.uk slash history.